the song that speaks of the end of that love, the pinnacle of that love. I was guilty with nothing to say And they were coming to take me away But then a voice from heaven was heard That said, let him go, take me instead and I should have been crucified I should have suffered and died I should have hung on that cross in disgrace But Jesus, God's Son, took my place Crown of thorns, the spear deep in his side And the pain that should have been mine The rusty nails were meant for me Oh yet, Christ took them and let me go free and I should have been crucified I should have suffered and died I should have hung on that cross in disgrace But Jesus, God's Son, took my place I should have hung on that cross in disgrace But Jesus, God's Son, took my place Aren't you thankful for that, amen? He took our place, that's why he had to come in human form We were talking about why he came, that's one of the reasons he came right there, to take our place. You know, just to, in review of this morning, go back to the last part of what we looked at this morning in First Peter chapter 2. Just the last two verses of what we looked at this morning. Peter writes, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. So we ended up here this morning looking at how God wants his children to live. He calls us dearly beloved. He's talking to believers in Jesus Christ people who are dear to the Lord, people who are loved of the Lord, people who've been accepted into his family. And he uses a term there, I beseech you. And the idea of that is Peter is begging them to let him help them as his shepherd. And there's a lot of times when I get excited preaching and, uh, and I get a little amped up a little bit, it's because what I'm trying to communicate is so critical and so serious, I don't want you to miss it. And that's what Peter is doing here to these young believers in this epistle he's writing to. He's begging them to get a hold of this. He's trying to be a shepherd in their life. And, and there's times where I, you know, I, I'm struggling with being a shepherd and, and I, I want to make sure we're getting it and I want to make sure I'm being effective and I want to make sure I'm getting the message across and because this is serious business. I'm accountable for my shepherding over the souls that pass through this church and I take that very, very seriously and Peter does too and he's begging them to let him help them 
as their shepherd. And, and, and also in verse 7, or verse 11, he's challenging them not to get comfortable living on this earth. He, he says, I beg you, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. And you know, a lot of times when we get too comfortable with this world, that's when we get sucked into sin. When we get too comfortable in this flesh, that's when we start giving in to fleshly lust. We, we need to be uncomfortable down here. You know, a fella came this morning for the very first time, and, and I was next door uh, seeing uh, little kids. I wanted to see Ruthie, and I wanted to see uh, Michael and, and Rachel and their little baby and all of that. And I saw their car out there, so I knew they were next door. So I went over there, and he came, found me. And he said, thank you for that message. That was so wonderful. And I says, well, we want to bless and we want to challenge. And he said, you succeeded. <laughs> and that's what Paul is, or Peter is challenging them. Don't get comfortable living here on this earth. And, and that's what I try to do every time I stand behind this pulpit and preach and teach. I, I'm challenging you. Get ready for eternity because eternity is going to be a lot longer than the time we have down here. And we, we want to live right here so we can uh, enjoy living up there more as, as with the blessings of the Lord. And Peter is warning them in verse 11 also. He's warning them not to become casualties in their journey on earth. And it breaks my heart. I've been here 21 years. 21 years today, I preached my first message as a pastor of Somerville Baptist Church. Interesting fun fact, 21 years ago yesterday, the first ministry I had as pastor here was a men's prayer breakfast. <laughs> Interesting. The faces have changed a lot over those 21 years. Some that were here aren't here anymore. And some that weren't there then are here now. And all of us that were here then have gotten a little older in the process. So things have changed a bit. But you know, in 21 years, sadly, we've seen some casualties along the way. The 12 years I was in Indiana, I saw some young people grow immensely in the youth ministry there. I saw some young people get saved in the youth ministry there. I saw some young people take on leadership in ministry there. But sadly, I saw some casualties along the way. People that get too sucked into the world, they become a casualty. People that allow temptation to control them and they, they're drawn into sin and and it creates a problem for them they don't get over. Casualties. And, Paul, and Peter here challenges them to abstain from fleshly lust. Now, abstaining is different than resisting. Abstaining is staying away from it. You know, resisting is when something that just kind of pops up and, and you just kind of push it away. That's resisting. You know, like you're driving down the road and you're minding your own business and you're watching the road and there's this billboard that is basically legal pornography on the road. It's just ridiculous, right? Now, you know, just because I see it, you know, I may not be able to control that, but once I know what it is, I need to not see it anymore, right? I do control that. That's resisting temptation. But abstaining from temptation is... You know, if I'm an alcoholic, do not, or if I, you know, feel that drinking is wrong and I struggle with that temptation, don't even go down that aisle. I don't even like going down the alcohol aisle uh, at any grocery stores. I, don't, I just don't even like going down there. Sometimes you have to because something you need is down there, but I just don't even like it. I want to abstain from it completely. You know, we need to abstain, we need to stay away from things that are a potential temptation to us. And that's what he's warning them, because if we don't abstain from it, if we don't stay away from it, and we get close to it, we run the risk of getting sucked into it, because it wars against our soul. 
It damages us. It hinders us. It hinders our effectiveness. And we're talking about maintaining our effectiveness. And Peter's dealing with this in a warning. Don't let sin destroy you. In the end there in verse 12, he's encouraging them to bring God, glory to God until he takes us to heaven. And that's one of the things I do when I'm preaching here. We're here to bring glory to God. And, and, and I want to encourage you to do that. Living for His glory, doing the right thing, resisting temptation, abstaining from fleshly lust. Those things bring glory to God. And, and, and here, chapter 5, chapter 5 is the end of the epistle that he writes. And he's still doing that. He's challenging them as a shepherd in, over a flock people he is ministering to and he cares about and he's writing to them and he's writing to the pastors in those churches and he's giving some direction to them as a pastor for the pastor because pastors need pastors too and one of the ways that we can maintain our effectiveness in Christ's mission on earth is by bringing God glory and we talked about that this morning, but here he's talking specifically about the role of the pastor, the shepherd, the under-shepherd. So one of the ways we can bring glory to God is by submitting to his under-shepherd that he's placed over the, the, his flock where we are part of. And he talks about the elders, and he calls himself an elder. And he, ta- and he tells them their job. Feed the flock of God. Oversee the flock of God. Do it willingly. And that willingly not only applies to the shepherd doing it willingly, it's a whole lot easier for the shepherd to watch over the flock when the flock is doing it willingly. Makes it a whole lot easier. And being an example. These are all things that the shepherd is to do. And as the shepherd is doing his job, guess what else needs to happen? The sheep need to be doing their job. Right? See, we, need, we bring glory by submitting to the leadership that God has in our lives. See, we need to, we need to submit to the under-shepherd so he can be used of God to guide us in his glory. See, you know, what I, you know what I feed you? I feed you what the Lord's laid on my heart. I feed you what the Lord's already fed me. I've said this before. Don't get mad at me when you get your toes stepped on because my toes got stepped on before your toes ever got stepped on. Right? I get preached to by the Lord as he's given me the message before you ever get preached to. That's part of the job of the shepherd, to feed the flock, to take oversight. The idea of oversight is to guide, is to care for, is to take care of. And, and you can help me do my job by you doing your job. By you listening when I'm trying to feed. There's nothing more frustrating than trying to feed somebody that's not eaten. <laughs> Have you ever tried to feed a little child and they're just not interested in eating, right? Frustrating, isn't it? Sometimes pastors feel that frustration. I'm trying to feed you and you're not eating. You're not listening. You're not getting it. You're not paying attention. You're goofing around with your phone or you're goofing around with this or you're goofing around with the other or you're just, you know, got that blank stare on your face because you've checked out and, you know, no, you know, the lights are on but nobody's home, Right? But if you want to help me do my job, you need to do your job. And that means listen to the message that God's given from his word. And another way you can help me do my job in guiding in your life is actually receive the counsel that is given. Nothing more frustrating than somebody coming to you saying, Pastor, I'd like some advice. And then you prayerfully give them some advice and they go the exact opposite direction. 
and then it blows up in their face and then they want to get mad at you. Why didn't you stop me? I tried to. <laughs> See, we need to listen to the, the message being given. We need to heed the counsel being given. And here's another thing that the sheep ought to do to help the shepherd do his job. Cooperate with him in his accountability over you. You know, I'm going to give an account for every soul I ministered to, how I ministered to them, but not how they benefited from it. I'm not accountable for your job. I'm accountable for my job. I'm not accountable for what you get out of a message. I'm accountable for how I deliver the message, how I prepare for the message. That's what I'm accountable for. You're accountable for receiving the message and doing something with the message. I'm not accountable for that part. So like parents, they're accountable for parenting. They're not accountable for how the child responds to the parenting. The child's responsible for that. If the child goes into rebellion, that's on the child, not on the parent. If the parent was biblical, if the parent was godly, if the parent was parenting right, the child can still go astray, correct? Well, that's not on the parent, that's on the child. Now, if the parent neglects parenting and doesn't take care of the child or abuses the child, then that's on the parent, right? Because that has to do with their parenting. But if the parent's doing their job and the child's not doing their job, then that's not on the parent, that's on the child. And the same thing's true in a church. If the pastor's doing his job, but the sheep aren't doing their job, that's not on the pastor, that's on the sheep. See, it's a two-way street. But it's all of this has to do with maintaining our effectiveness in Christ's mission on the earth. Because all of us, if we're believers in Jesus Christ, we are all part of his mission on the earth. The question is how effective we are in that mission. See, we need to submit to the under-shepherd as he's not only guiding, leading, but as he's feeding God's nourishing word. We see that in verse 2. Feed the flock. You know, one of the ways that you can feed on what is being given is by being in attendance. I'm glad you are here. Amen? You cannot hear what you're not available to hear, right? Whether it's on the internet, for those staying home, you can be faithful there, right? Or you can neglect it there. That's one of the things I'm, I'm not really excited about the internet uh, church service because I, I know for a fact it's easier to get distracted there than it is here, right? It's possible to get distracted anywhere. But the reality is we've got to be attentive or we've got to be in attendance. But the, the next step is important too. Not only be in attendance, but be attentive, Right? You can show up and still not show up, right? <laughs> right? You get what I'm saying? You can physically be here, but not in reality be here. Not be engaged. But see, I can't make you come. Because if I could, this place would be filled. Right? I can't make people come. I can invite them. I can try to offer something that they feel is worthy of coming. But I can't make them come. And, and just like I can't make them come, I can't make them pay attention if they do come. Right? Now I can correct somebody. It's pretty embarrassing when the pastor says, hey, you guys knock it off over there. I can do that. But I still can't make them be attentive. See, that's on you. And here's another thing that's on you that I can't make you do. I can't make you be teachable. Right? See, a lot of times people want to blame the teacher when the student's not getting something, but it's not on the teacher, it's on the student because they're not teachable or they're not attentive or they're not in attendance. See, you can help me do my job if you do your job. And together, we can help each other be more effective in Christ's mission here on this earth. And another reason why we need to submit to the under-shepherd is so he can lead us in God's will as being an example to follow. 
See, the idea is the shepherd needs to oversee the spiritual progress of the, of the flock. He's the overseer. He's the one that's making sure things are moving along. He's the one that's making sure everything's being taken care of. He's overseeing. Letting him lead. Not, and not, ha- not having him do it by constraint. Now, a shepherd does have a staff, and sometimes he's got to pull the sheep with the staff or prod the sheep with the, the staff, right? But it's better if the sheep just kind of do, do what the shepherd's leading them to do. See, not, not having to be constrained by being stubborn. And being cooperative, doing it willingly. The shepherd needs to do his job willingly. The sheep need to do their job willingly. When we do it willingly, things work better. As we follow the example, Paul said it this way, follow me as I follow Christ, right? And I'm supposed to be following Christ as the under-shepherd. I'm supposed to be following the chief shepherd. And if I'm following the chief shepherd as the under shepherd, you ought to be following me. Correct? And we're all following him, right? He's the one really in the lead, not me. See, we need to be faithful to let the shepherd lead in our lives. And another reason to submit to the under shepherd as Peter talks about here in these first few verses of chapter 5 is so he can be used of God to prepare us for Christ's return. I want you to take your Bible, hold 1 Peter, and go toward the front of the Bible just a little bit. Right before 1 Peter is James. And then right before that, you come to Hebrews. And I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 13. This isn't in your notes. Hebrews chapter 13, and I want you to look at something here in verse 17, because we're all going to stand and give an account to the Lord, right? Correct? I'm going to give an account for shepherding, you're going to be given an account for being part of the flock, but we're all going to give an account, right? Notice what verse 17 in chapter 13 of the book of Hebrews says about this relationship. It says, Obey them that have rule over you, And submit yourselves. Submit is a self-induced honor. I I submit willingly to your leadership. And that's exactly what Peter's talking about in 1 Peter 5. And he says, for they watch for your souls. That goes under the idea of oversight. Taking the oversight thereof. They watch for your souls. Notice the next phrase though. As they that must give an account... That they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable, say it with me, for you. Not for me, for you. See, I'm accountable to God for my part, but you're accountable for God for your part. See, when I stand and give an account to the Lord for shepherding here, and the Lord says, hey, uh, Frank, what about so-and-so over here? Lord, I tried. I warned them. I was compassionate. I tried to tell them, you need to pay attention. You need to, you need to make sure you're ready to listen when you come to church. And they slept through half the time they were there. And the other half the time, they weren't paying attention anyway. And I tried to talk to them about it, and they just got stubborn about it. I tried. And the Lord's going to, you know, some, hopefully the Lord will say, yep, you tried. You did your part. But then that person's going to come before the Lord and the Lord's going to say, so what's your excuse about not letting your pastor shepherd you? Right? That's what it's saying right here. See, I have to give an account for my oversight of your soul. I have to. But it's a whole lot better for you if I can say, man, they were a blessing. <laughs> they were easy to shepherd. They were, they were faithful. They were attentive. They were engaged. They were involved. They were, they were willing servants. 
I did not have to work real hard to take care of them. <laughs> they made it easy. <laughs> and the Lord will say, yep, you're right. And they're going to be blessed for that. That's a whole lot better for you, isn't it? And that's exactly what Paul, Peter is talking about here and over in Hebrews is talking about. Let me do my job by you doing your job. And together we have a better accountability to the Lord. Amen? And we're more effective down here in doing his job. Here's another thing. Not only by letting the shepherd shepherd, but point number two, we bring glory to God, are bringing glory to God by yielding to him and not to Satan. Peter deals with that in the next few verses about humbling ourselves under his authority, his mighty hand. Letting him exalt you and not you exalt you. Casting your care upon him and not carrying your care yourself. So that you can be sober and vigilant. You know, care causes us not to be as vigilant against Satan. You know, when you're, when you're hunting, you need to be looking, right? You also need to pay attention where your feet are going because you don't want to make a bunch of noise, right? stumbling and breaking limbs and just making a whole bunch of chaos out there. That's not a really good thing to do. So you got to pay attention where you're walking. But if you're just walking in the woods like this, you're not hunting. You're taking a stroll. Right? Because you got to see the animal before the animal knows you're there. Or it's bye-bye animal, right? And when we're loaded down with care, we're not looking out here. We're all down like this, aren't we? We're not, we're not walking attentively. We're burdened down with care. So God says, cast your care upon him so you can be sober and vigilant, paying attention to the adversary, the devil, who wants to destroy you. See, we've got to cast our care upon him if we're going to be effective in our ministry. So what is he talking about yielding to him and not to Satan? Well, first, humbling yourselves under God's authority and power. We cannot bring glory to God if we're living in rebellion to God. We need to humble ourselves before God. If he's Lord, we need to treat him like Lord, right? That means he's in charge, not us. I mean, we do what he says, not we tell him what to do. A lot of Christians got this thing all backwards. They're telling God what to do. Instead of letting him tell them what to do. That's all messed up. He's Lord, not us. Right? We need to humble ourselves before him. See, we cannot honor those in authority when we're rebelling against their authority. When we're rebelling against God as Lord, he, we're, not, we're not submitting to him as Lord. We're not honoring him as Lord. See, we need to submit to him so he can lift us up his way. There's way too many people who are, and, and there's churches where this happens way too often. They're too busy lifting themselves up. The Lord can't lift them up anyway. He's, got a, he's busy pushing them down. He's trying to humble them because they're not willing to humble themselves. You know, it's a whole lot better if we humble ourselves and we let him lift us up instead of us trying to lift us up and him humbling us. It's a whole lot less painful that way too. Our job is to humble us. His job is to lift us. See, we need to humble ourselves under his authority as Lord in our lives. And we need to trust our burdens to him because of his love for us. We need to cast our care because we know he cares for us. We need to believe he cares so much that we are able to trust our cares to him. Just like Christy said, how big is your God? Is your God big enough to care for you? Then cast your care upon him and don't carry your cares. See, if we believe he's able, we sang the song, nothing is impossible, right? So why do we carry our cares? It's impossible to us, right? But it's not impossible to him. So if we really believe nothing is impossible for him, why don't we trust him enough to cast our cares upon him? Knowing he's able, more than able, to accomplish what concerns me today. 
See, if we trust him with our cares, then we should not be carrying those cares. You know, when we cast our cares, the idea of the word cast there means to let it go. It's sort of like a frisbee. If you're just doing this, you're not playing frisbee. You're really looking kind of dorky doing this with a frisbee. That's not the purpose of the frisbee, right? You're not playing frisbee until you let it go, right? And hopefully it glides to whoever you're playing frisbee with, unless you put it at a little slant and maybe it comes back to you, right? But the whole idea is you let go of it. And that's how this word casting means. It means to let go of it. And there's way too many of us that we, we, we pray and we say we're casting our care on the Lord. But then we say, okay, Lord, amen. Let me have that back and let me carry it off with me. (laughs) That's, that's not what, you're not trusting the Lord with it. You're trusting yourself with it. See, we need to trust him with our burdens. Why? So we can be vigilant. So we can be sober. So we can guard, resist the devil in faith. See, care impedes faith. And we need faith to resist the devil. Right? So if you're carrying all this burden of care, number one, you're not sober, you're not vigilant, and you're not strong in faith to resist the devil. You are a sitting duck for the devil. Because you're carrying all this burden that God says, I love you enough, you can give it to me. See, these are things that are, we need to yield to the Lord, not to Satan. We need to resist Satan and not the Lord. There's way too many Christians got that all backwards. They're resisting the wrong person and they're yielding to the wrong person. See, God tells us to resist Satan in our life daily. Don't resist God. He's on your side. He's trying to help you out. See, God's word can help us be aware of Satan's strategies. And God's word can strengthen us and defend us against Satan's attacks. And then the last thing I want you to see here is bringing God glory by submitting in his, to his dominion. Look at verse 10 and 11. It says, but the, God of all, uh, but the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. He's talking about the Lord's authority. He's talking about the the Lord's dominion over us. See, we bring God glory through His grace by faith in Christ. Aren't you glad He's the God of all grace? The Father of comforts, the God of all mercies, as 1 Corinthians puts it. Who's able to give us the grace we need, whatever the need is. He's the God of all grace. See, He has grace enough to save us when we trust in Christ. See, He can make us complete. That's the word perfect there. It's talking about being complete. Established. That, that's the idea of firm. Established. Firm. And strengthened. Strong in the Lord. By His grace. By faith in Him. See, the Lord can do that for us. But only as we submit to His authority in our lives do we benefit from that completion and that that stability and that strength and settle you. That's the idea of peace and rest. We need to rest in the Lord, right? There's so many Christians, they are not resting in the Lord. They're all, they're all anxious and they're all worried and they're all uh, struggling and they're all f- just worked up about everything. And the Lord says, don't do that to yourself. Let my grace settle you. Calm you down. See, we need to let his grace help us by faith in Christ. So that we can grow in Christ. See, he says, The God of all grace who hath called us 
to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. We need to be growing in the Lord. This idea of being perfected, it's about growing in the Lord. Take your Bible, hold 1 Peter 5, but go to 2 Peter 3, the end of 2 Peter. Look at the end of 2 Peter chapter 3. Very similar statements here. And he's warning them about deception here. Beginning in verse 14, look at it. It says, Wherefore, beloved, here he uses that same word, he's talking to believers. Seeing ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace. That's the, st- the settling, the established, the strengthening in peace. Without spot and blameless. That's the, the, the perfect or the complete. An account that the long suffering of the Lord is salvation, even as our brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, all, Peter's saying, all of Paul's epistles, God gave him one thing to say over and over and over. Speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest or twist, as they do also other scriptures unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, look at this statement, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace, And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Here Peter, just like in 1 Peter, he's challenging them to grow, to mature in their faith, through the word of God, to resist the devil, to resist error, going astray. Here, how? By growing in the Lord, by growing in his word. By letting his word speak to him. And he refers to the epistles of Paul Helping them to grow. Understanding God's grace. Knowing, him, knowing God more personally and intimately. And learning from his word to be strong in him. And we bring glory to God by staying faithful to him. Here he warns them not to be led astray. To go into error, false teaching. But to grow in grace and know the Lord more. Back in 1 Peter 5, he tells them there, to him, or to, to, uh, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And, he, and, Paul, and Peter mentions Paul's writings in 2 Peter. And I want you to go to one of Paul's writings, and we're going to close there. Go to the book of Colossians. One of Paul's epistles to the church at Colossae, In Colossians chapter 3. And I want you to see what Paul writes about here. To these believers. To help them maintain their walk with the Lord and their effectiveness in his work on earth. He says in chapter 3 verse 12. "Put Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, Kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So he says, put these things on. Mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind. We looked at that in 1 Peter. Meekness, long-suffering, forgiving one another, just like God forgives us. These are things that will maintain our walk with the Lord. Our effectiveness here on this earth. But notice what else he says. And above all, all these things put on charity. Love for one another. Just like Brother Mike mentioned. the, The love of the brethren. Which is a bond of perfectness. But look at verse 15. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. That's dominion. Rule. Right? Just like in 1 Peter 5. His rule in your life. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. 
to which also ye are called in one body, and be thankful. Just like Peter's talking about in a church setting. Look at verse 7. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. So God's word helps us to maintain our walk with the Lord. Being attendance and being attentive and being teachable. Letting God's word work. Letting the shepherd feed you God's word. But look at verse 17. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. You know who can help us the most to make sure we're right with the Lord and we're walking with him? The Holy Spirit. Helping us make sure that we're speaking truth and doing right, listening to the Holy Spirit. And that, my friend, is the whole purpose of why we gather in God's house. To make sure we're staying right with the Lord. That's why we need to get in the Word. To make sure we're staying right with the Lord and growing with the Lord and walking with the Lord. And that's why God has an under-shepherd, under the chief shepherd, to shepherd the flock and help the flock continue to go the direction of the Lord. And that's why the, Jesus himself established the Lord's table as a time of self-examination to make sure we're right with the Lord, to make sure we're, we're abstaining from fleshly lust, to make sure we're resisting the devil, to, to take inventory, to take stock, that we are growing, that we are maturing, that we are walking with the Lord, that we are listening to the Spirit. My friend, the question is, are you submitting to the Lord? Are you submitting to His Word? Are you submitting to His under-shepherd? Are you resisting the devil and not resisting the Lord? Are you under the authority of the Lord in your life and doing His will for your life? My friend, when we make sure we're doing those things, we're ready for this. We're ready to receive the Lord's table in a way that honors Him. Because we've made sure we're right with Him. And my friend, that's what this invitation is for. As we come to this invitation in preparation for the Lord's table, just like in, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat. I'd like you to bow your heads and close your eyes as we come to this invitation time.